Okay, so let's let's get started. We're on Daf Chav Ches Amid Aleph. Yes, of course. Neshama should have an Aliyah. Okay, we're at the very top of the Amid on Chav Ches Amid Aleph. The Mishnah yesterday had taught us that there are certain people who are puzzled at Edus and to puzzle to be a Dayan because they're related to me. And sometimes, most of the time, it's blood relatives, but it could also be related through marriage. And we're not going to go through all of the permutations now, but the Gemara had asked the question. I'm going to try to um, um, decomplicate this as much as possible because, you know, with when we, remember, if you remember from Yavamas when we were learning all about all the relatives, it's sometimes going to get confusing. I'm going to try and simplify it as much as possible. The Gemara had asked the question, how do we know that just because someone's related to me, um, uh, they become disqualified for testimony? The Gemara had said it's based on a pasuk lo yumsu avos albanim, uvanim lo yumsu alavos, that fathers should not die because of sons, and sons should not die because of fathers. And the Gemara had said that the fact that the word avos is written in the plural, that tells me it doesn't say lo yumas av albain that a father should not die for a son, but fathers. So what are we dealing with with fathers? We're talking about two people who are first-generation relatives, meaning they're at the same level generation, relatives, meaning brothers, Those they're the, and they're two fathers of their respective families. So not only do we learn from here that a son is puzzled to his father, a father is puzzled to his son, but avos, meaning they're on the same generational level, they're puzzled to each other because they're related in some way. So that's where we're up to in the Gemara. Ashkachan avos lebanim ubanim la avos the kol shkain avos la hadadi but banim lebanim minala. So so far we've seen that the fathers are puzzled to each other. Reuven and Shimon, who are brothers, are both respect their fathers to their respective families. They're puzzled to their sons, and their sons are puzzled to them. And not only that, but we also learn that a man is puzzled to his nephew, and a nephew is puzzled to his uncle, because Shimon's son is puzzled to Reuven, and vice versa. Okay. We learned that all so far. But now the question is, banim lebanim minolam. How do you see from that pasuk that first cousins, Shimon's son and Ruvain's son, are puzzled to each other? How do I know this? And that's one of the rules that the Mishnah had said. So, in Cain, lichtov kra lo yimsu avos al bain, my banim da filu banim lahadod. And once again, by reading the pasuk in the plural, the pasuk says banim, not ben, tells me, that when you're dealing with second generation relatives, the son of Reuven and the son of Shimon, banim, they are puzzled to each other. So that's how I know that first cousins cannot testify for each other. So um, the Gemara now says, Ashkechan banim lahadari, banim la'alma minola. Okay, fine. That tells me that cousins cannot testify for each other. How do you know that two cousins can't be part of the same group of witnesses to testify for a third party? In other words, it's one thing to say that they can't testify for each other. How do you know that they can't group together and testify for a third party? So Amar Rami Bar Chama Svarihi Kiritanya. So Rami Bar Chama says you don't need a pasuk. It's based on logic, because there's a brisa that says Ein Ha'idim Nasin Zomim In Achi Yazumu Shneim. The Isal Kadaita Chabanim La Alma Ksheira Nimsa Eizomim Neherag Beidus Achiv. The the argument is like this. We have a brisa that says that the only way that you can make someone an Eid Zomim, Eidim Zomim is what? We prove that they're liars, and as a result, the Torah says, you do to them, you give them the penalty that they attempted to do to the accused. So if they attempted to bring the death penalty to the accused, you give them the death penalty instead. Now, there's a halacha by Eidim Zomim, based on the psukim, that if only one of the two witnesses is proven to be a liar, then you can't punish him. You can only punish the two witnesses if both of them are proven to be liars. But if only one is proven to be a liar, then it, the whole thing doesn't work. The whole halacha doesn't apply. Now, if two cousins could be witnesses for a third party, it would turn out that I'm going to get, if my cousin and I are testifying falsely, then I'm going to get the death penalty because my cousin is also a liar. So it turns out that my first cousin contributed to my death. And the Torah says that a relative cannot contribute to my death. Lo yumsu avos albanim. Right? So if that's the case, so then, since that's the svara, says Rami Bar Chama, since I can only be convicted as, as an, as an aid zoming, 
as a result of my co-conspirator witness, if he's a cousin of mine, and therefore he's the cause or indirect cause of my death, then, uh, it, then it would be that I'm dying because of a relative, and the Torah says that relatives don't die because of relatives. But that would be only Adam Zimmer. Why do you, how do you not apply that to all cases? Because every set of witnesses has to have the potential to be Adam Zimmer. The point, that's, that's the spar that Romy Barcham is saying. Since this, this, every right. set of witnesses right. potentially Adam Zimmer, they can't be related. So the Gemara now says, Amar le Rava. Rava is unhappy with this svar. We saw this Mishnah in Bava Basra. A person, in order to prove ownership of a field, has to show that he's been living there for three consecutive years without contest. And he has to bring witnesses to that fact. Let's say a person says, well, I have three sets of witnesses. Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi are brothers. Ruvain saw me living there in 2015. Shimon saw me living there in 2016. And Levi saw me living there in 2017. And I have a friend who's not related, and he saw me live there all three years. So he's going to testify with each of the brothers for each year. So the halacha is that this is acceptable testimony. We don't say that um, because Reuben, Shimon, and Levi are all brothers, we throw out all their testimony because each one is testifying else. on something else, on a different year. So therefore, that's valid. It's admissible testimony. However, there's, there's one thing. In the case that they become Adib Zomamin, let's say witnesses testify that one of the brothers is a liar together with his co-witness. So then, do we make that brother pay? No. Why? Because I only testified that you were living there for one year, so I was a liar. But tes testimony that you were living there for one year does not prove you're the owner. So my testimony alone is not enough to make you lose money, to make you lose your, to make the other guy lose his property. So therefore, I can't be incriminated unless all three brothers are incriminated as being liars, as being Adam Zomamin. If all three brothers are incriminated as being liars together with that other guy, so then they're all Adam Zomamin, and then all collectively will have to pay for that property to the guy that they tried to swindle. Now, Nimtza Eid Zomim Mishali Mamun Ve'edus Achiv. So Rabbi says, according to your logic, Rami Barchama, that should never come to fruition. That if all three brothers are found to be Adam Zomamin, then they'll have to pay. Why? Because my brother is contributing to my liability. My brother is contributing to the fact that I have to end up paying. And if you're saying that a, brother, a relative can never be the cause of my incrimination, you know, using that svar that you just gave, so then this halacha shouldn't apply. So you see that what your logic is, is faulty. <coughs> so you have to conclude that the, the fact that I'm proven to be a liar has nothing to do with my brother, has nothing to do with my co-witness, it has to do with the fact that someone else testified that I was with them at a certain time in a certain place. That's why I'm an aid zomi. Granted, there's an indirect contribution from the co-witness that I'm testifying with, but that's not the direct cause, and therefore you can't say that that's the reason why uh, he can't, I can't testify together with a cousin. la'alma. <laughs> So rather, says Rava, it's not based on Svar. It's based on a Pasuk. It's that same Pasuk. The Pasuk is a little bit repetitious. It says, Lo yumsu avos al banim, ubanim lo yumsu al avos. Fathers should not die because of their sons. Sons should not die because of their fathers. The second time it says banim, it could have written it in the singular. Or it could have just said, not sons at all. It should have just said, and they shall not die because of the fathers. So that extra word, ubanim, teaches me that even when you have two banim, you have two relatives that are cousins, that's how we're defining banim here, second generation, therefore they're cousins, they cannot testify not only for each other, but they can't testify together for a third party. That's what we learned from the extra word. So ashkechan krove ha'av, krove ha'eminol. Now let's go to the next line of reasoning. We learned from our Mishnah, or from this pasuk that relatives from my father are puzzle because it says avos in the pasuk. So a son from father from Ruvain 
And then if Shimon's the brother of Ruvain, so his son, two second generation guys from the same family, meaning first cousins, are Pasula Edas because they're related through the father. How do you know if people are related through the mother that they're also Pasula? That's what our Mishnah had said. So Amar Kra, Avos Avos Trezimni, Meno Inu Likrove Ha'av, Tino Inu Likrove Ha'em. The answer is, is because the word Avos appears in the Pasuk twice. It could have written Avos only once. So that extra time it says Avos it implies Imahos as well, mothers as well. So any relation through the mother is also makes me Pasul Avos. Ashkechan Lechovel is Chus But here, again, the question is the Pasuk is only addressing making someone liable through familial testimony. How do you know that even testifying on behalf of someone to give them merit, a relative is not valid? Because the verb shall die is written the second time unnecessarily. And so the first time is to tell me that I can't convict them if I'm a relative. And the second one is to tell me that I can't even bring them merit if I'm a relative. So now the Gemara says, okay, but that Pasuk is talking about causing someone to die in court giving them the death penalty. How do you know that even bring them liability monetarily a relative cannot do? So, Omar Kra, Mishpat Echad Yelachem, Mishpat HaShav Elachem. We've seen this Pasuk before. The Torah says there shall be one consistent law throughout, which teaches me that unless the Torah states to the contrary, whatever law is applied to capital law also apply to monetary law. So just like relatives are invalid for capital punishment, they're also invalid for monetary penalties as well. Amarav, Amarav, Achi Abba lo yo'idli hu uveno v'chasano, af ani lo o'idlo, ani uveni v'chasani. So Rav says, my uncle, my father's brother, cannot testify for me, and I cannot testify for him. But not only can my uncle not testify for me, but his son and son-in-law cannot testify for me either, meaning his, my first cousin, or my first cousin through marriage, my, my, my female first cousin's husband, also cannot testify for me. And the same thing goes for me. I cannot testify for my uncle, neither I nor my son nor my son-in-law. Now, the Gemara now what Rav is now saying is he's introducing a new halacha that we haven't seen before, which is my uncle is generation one, I'm generation two, my son is generation three. And now Rav is saying that generation three cannot testify for generation one, even though they've skipped a generation. That's a chiddush, because all we've seen up until now is generation one to one, generation two to two, and generation one to two, or generation two to one. So the Gemara's question is, So the Gemara's question is, why should that be? Up until now, all we've seen from our Mishnah is, as I've said, one to one, two to two, one to two, two to one, but not one to three, or three to one. So the Gemara now says, "My chasanu dekatani b'masnisim chasan b'no." So the Gemara gives a little bit of a strange answer, but we'll accept it for now. The Gemara says that if you look at our Mishnah, it talked about that I'm puzzled to testify for my uncle, and my and uh, in other words, the Elohim Akrovin, and it said. They, their sons, and their sons-in-law. So when the Mishnah had said, they, their sons, and their sons-in-law, we thought it was referring to a second generation. But comes along the Gemara and says, another, read to, another way to read the Mishnah when it says, they, their sons, and their sons-in-law, means their sons-in-law of their sons. Them. These people, let's say brothers and sisters, uh, brothers and brothers-in-law, Hain, Uvenehem, and their sons, and their sons' sons-in-law. That's what it means. So it is talking about a third generation. So the Gemara says, if you want, if that's how the Mishnah is referring to third generation, the Lisni Ben Beno. Why didn't you say their sons' sons, not instead of their sons' sons-in-law? Why complicate it? The Gemara says, Milsa Agavurche Kamash Malan the Baal Ki Ishto. It's telling me an incidental principle that a man and his wife have the same halachic status. If my wife is related to you, then I'm related to you. So therefore it says sons, and sons-in-law, my son's son-in-law, to tell me that my son's son-in-law is just like my son's son. 
So the Ella had the Tony Rebichia Shmona Abo Shein Esun Be Arba Hani Tlas and Vitartein Havi. But one second, there's a Bryce of Rebichia that says that when we count the number of people who are related to each other that are puzzle, we'll get a total of 28. We get eight that are listed from generation one in our Mishnah, and then the second generation is they, their sons, and their sons in law. That's another eight, and another eight, that's 24. But according to what you're saying, if you're going down to the third generation, it's not 24, then add another 8 for the third generation of, of, of that list, and you should get 32. So the Gemara says, Elola chasano mamish. So the Gemara says, you're right. Really, our mission is not addressing the third generation directly. But the fact, the very fact that someone is my son-in-law makes him further removed from me than my son because he's not a blood relative. Sorry to disappoint all the sons-in-law. But a son-in-law is like a son, but he's not a blood relation. So therefore, he's considered to be just like a third generation instead of a second generation. And therefore, if a son-in-law is puzzle, it follows logically that a third generation blood relative is also puzzle. That's what the Gemara seems to be saying. Well, then the Gemara says, but wait a minute. If that's the case, that a son-in-law is puzzle, well, let's think about this for a second. You have two first cousins, Ruvain's son and Shimon's son. They're puzzle to each other because that's two to generation two to generation two. If you're now telling me that the son-in-law of Ruvain is also puzzle to Shimon's son, then that's not generation two to two, it's generation two to three, because we view a son-in-law as being one generation removed. Rav has gone on record as stating that generation two to three is not puzzle edus. Generation three to one is puzzle, but generation two to three is, three to two is not puzzle. El Rav do Omar Karebi El Azar. So you're right, says the Gemara. We're going to fall off of that argument. A son-in-law is not we don't skip him a generation based on our Mishnah. But rather, we're going to look at a b'risa. This b'risa is what Rav goes like. The Tanya, Rebbe Elazar Omer, Kishem sha'achi abba lo yo'edli hu uveno v'chasano. Kach ben achi abba lo yo'edli hu uveno v'chasano. The Rebbe Elazar goes on record explicitly in the b'risa is saying that just like my uncle cannot testify for me, neither he nor his son nor his son-in-law, but not only that, but also my kach um, ben achiyaba, so, so too my first cousin cannot testify for me, neither he nor his son or his son-in-law. So there you see explicitly that Rab, that Rab is subscribing to Rebbe Lazar, who says generation three to generation one is no good. But he's even saying generation three to generation two is no good. Vakati habalei But included in Rebbe Lazar's words are, are three to one and three to two. So how can Rav subscribe to that if he's gone on record as saying three to two is okay? So the Rav actually shlishi b'sheni. So the more answer is Rav sover lekavosei b'chadu poligalei b'chadu. So the answer is is that Rav has the prerogative to agree with Rebbe Lazar in one respect to say that three to one is no good, but he disagrees with Rebbe Lazar on the three to two issue. He holds that three to two is is acceptable. So my time at the Rav. What's Rav's reasoning that three to one is no good? Generation three to generation one let's say, an uncle to a great-nephew, right? What's the svara? He takes the extra word banim to, to teach me that it's adding an additional generation because he, he puts the two words banim together. Right? That's, that's the way he reads the passage. Banim ubanim means children and grandchildren. Okay. The Rebbe Lazar al Banim Amar Rachmana Psule Da Abo Shadi Abanim, and Rebbe Lazar says Al Banim. That preposition of Al tells me that you go even further. That Psule Da Avos, whoever's puzzled to my father is puzzled to me as well, and therefore, if generation three is puzzled to generation one, generation three is also puzzled to generation two. Amar Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman now states, Achi Chamosi Lo Yoidli. Ben achi chamosi lo yoidli, lo yoidli, ben achos chamosi lo yoidli. Rav Nachman says that my shviger's brother cannot testify for me. My, you know, my mother-in-law's brother cannot testify for me. Ben achi chamosi, 
the son of that man that we just mentioned, my Schwiger's brother. That man's son cannot testify for me. And my Schwiger's sister, her son also cannot testify for me. The Tanatuna, this seems to be drawn from our Mishnah. That Bala Choso, Ubala Chos Aviv, Ubala Chos Imo, Heinu Venein Vachasonein. That when the Mishnah says that the husband of my sister, my sister's husband, and my father's sister's husband, and my mother's sister's husband, all of them are puzzled to me for Edus, and it includes their sons and their sons in law. If you think about it, that's essentially the same thing that Rav Nachman is saying. If you just reverse the orientation, it turns out that my Shvigar's brother cannot testify for me, nor, nor that man's son. Okay, Amar Ravashi ki havinan be'ula iboilan, achi chamiv mahu, ben achi chamiv mahu, ben achos chamiv mahu. And Ravashi says a similar thing. He says, when I was by Ula, we had this question. Can my Shvigar's brother, my Shvigar's brother's son, or my Shvigar's sister's son, are they kosher to testify for me? And Amr Lantini Suha, Achiv, Vachi Aviv, Vachi Imo, Heinu Venein Vachasameyan. He says, if you look at the Mishnah carefully and just change the orientation, switch it around, you'll discover that those are included in people who are related to you and therefore cannot, from the Mishnah, and therefore cannot testify for you. Rav Ikla, Lemizban Givili. So Rav once went into the Sofer store to buy some parchment. And while he was there, he found some people who had shilas. Can a man testify for his stepson's wife? In other words, to testify that his stepson's wife is liable or is, is, uh, is meritorious to somebody. Is, is there any relation there? We learned in the Mishnah that a stepson you can't testify for. What about your stepson's wife? So, Visura Amri Baal Ki Amri Isha Kebailah. So in Surah they phrase it as this, that a husband is just like his wife, and in Pumpadisa they say that a wife is just like her husband, but it boils down to the same thing. I'm related to my stepson either because he's like my son because I'm married to his mother, or because his, my, or, and I'm puzzled to my stepson's wife because she's just like him, and if I'm puzzled for him, I'm puzzled to his wife as well. The Amar of Huna Amar Rav, Minayin Sha'isha Kabaila, how do you know that a woman is just like her husband from uh, in these halachic issues? <laughs> so, because the Torah says, do not uncover the nakedness of your uncle's wife because she's your aunt. Now, that's not really accurate. <laughs> my uncle's wife is not my aunt. The word aunt in Hebrew implies a blood relative. And she's not my aunt. She's only related to me through marriage. So you see from here that if she's married to my blood uncle, then she's like my blood relative. She's like my aunt. So that's how you know that Isha Kabbalah, that a woman, is, uh, a woman and man are just like uh, one unit. Whatever the halacha applies to the man applies to the woman as well. What do we call in Hebrew that woman, the, the aunt who's not your no. relative? Eshet Dodo, the wife of your uncle. In modern Hebrew, she's called the Doda. Uh, this is the te- this is the technical language of the Bible. Okay. Ubal imo hu uveno vachasano. The Mishnah had also told us that my um, mother's husband, my mother's husband. So I'm not related to him. I'm his stepson. But not only is my mother's husband puzzled, but also his son, presumably even the son that he has from my mother. Is puzzle, my half brother as well. So the Gemara says, <coughs> Why do you have to repeat that? The Mishnah already said that your brother is puzzled to you, so this is your half brother. What's the difference? <laughs> the answer is, is because let's say he's my stepbrother, that's not blood related to me all, at all, because my stepfather brought him in from his prior marriage. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> but Rav Chizda said that such a person is kosher, since he's not related to you um, at all. There's no blood relation. He's only related to you through your parents' marriage, through your mother's marriage to his father, so he's kosher. So, Amr le lo shmiya la chadar reb yirmiya, Amr lehu lo shmiya li klamr lo severely. So they said to him, Didn't, what about reb yirmiya's explanation? They said, I never heard it, meaning he's saying in a polite way, I don't hold that way. 
But then we're back to the same question. Why does the Mishnah have to say it? And then it turns out that the son of my stepfather is my half-brother. So then why does the Mishnah have to say it? If I already know that a brother is Very simple, says the Gemara. I might have thought if the word Achib only appeared in the Mishnah, it was referring to a half-brother from the, from the paternal side. The Chiddush is that even though he's from my, only from maternally he's my half-brother, because we share the mother, but we don't share the father, he's also puzzled to aid us. Amar Achizda, Avi chatan vavi kala meidim ze alze velodamu lahadadi ela ki achla ledana. This is, you'll find this amusing. The mechutanim are not related to each other, and therefore they can testify for each other, and the reason is, is because they're like a lid that is placed on a barrel that is not meant to fit on it. In other words, the point is that, yes, they came into this relationship because of their kids, but the kids fit together great, but the in-laws don't have to fit. <laughs> and therefore, because they have no real other connection other than their children, I'm sorry, Jaime. It's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's, uh, even though they're, so they're not really considered to be related, and therefore they can testify for each other. So we do that I had that uh, at a wedding when the chutzpah asked me to be aid by the chuppah. I don't think the rabbis liked it too much, but they said it was okay. I had the situation as yeah. well. I, I wasn't the Masider Kiddushan. A young man who was a relative was, was called upon to, uh, to be the Masider Kiddushan, and he called up his shver. He was the brother of the kala, and he called upon his father-in-law to be one of the aid. Since they'd already called him up, I let it go. But really, it's... So mechutanim also, they would uh, what? let it, even, that wasn't mechutanim though, right? They, that was the mechutanim mm-hmm. of the kala, the, the, of the kala's parents. Okay. They were, in other words, the brother of the kala was the Masader Kiddushin. Right. He called up his shver to uh-huh. be one of the edim for his sister's wedding. I thought that was not right. Uh-huh. You know, I thought that was not yeah, right. But, but, but once it was done already, I didn't want to embarrass him, so I let it go. But really, it's not proper to do A man is allowed to testify for his betrothed bride, his fiance. Why? They haven't been intimate. They're not. There's no real connection between the two of them. Mm-hmm. And Ravina qualifies that and he says that's only to find her to testify where she would be liable, but to testify so that she gets merit. You can't testify because you have an emotional connection to her. You're biased. Velohi, lo shna la'afuke, velo shna li'iluye, lo mehema. But the Gemara's final psaac is that a fiancé can never testify for his fiancé, even if it's to provide her demerit, because he is considered to be connected to her because they're betrothed. My daitach, kedama rabbi chia bar ami mishmei du'ula, ishto arusa la'onin velo metame la v'cheni lo'nones velo metame lo meisa eno yarsha meisu govek suvasa. He says, you thought that they could testify for each other because you were familiar with the, with the b'risa that we learned elsewhere, that when a man is betrothed to a woman and, uh, and she dies, then he doesn't sit shiva for her, and if he's a kohen, he's not allowed to be metame for her, and vice versa. If he dies, she doesn't sit shiva for him. So you wanted to, and, and furthermore, if, if Mesa, if she dies, the, the fiancé does not inherit her estate, and if she dies, she just collects her, uh, uh, if he dies, rather, she just collects her ksuva, provided that he had guaranteed the ksuva from the time of the Eresim. But, so you want to argue from there, so you see they're not related, because uh, a Kohen can't be Matame, you don't sit Shiva for her. So they're not related. But it's not, he says, there's no comparison, because hasam b'she'ero tola rachmana akati lav she'erohi. Hacha mishum ikruve daitahu v'ha ikarva daite legaba. He says, you're comparing apples and oranges. The reason why you don't sit shiva, you don't, you're, if you're a kohen, you're not metame for a fiancé that dies, is because there in Parshas Emor, the Torah says, ki im lish ero ha-karove love. A kohen can only mourn or be, make himself tame for someone who is she'ero. There's a physical connection, either through blood relation or through physical uh, uh, intimacy. And since she's only my fiancé, we've never lived together, so she's not, there's no, there's no a physical connection. But over here, the reason for being puzzled to Edis has nothing to do with physical connection. It's got to do with the emotional connection, because we're related in some way. Once I become engaged to a woman, we're emotionally connected, and therefore I can't be an aid for her 
no matter no matter what. So why don't we say the same thing with the Mechutanim? They have an emotional attachment. It's not the negative side. It's, 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 a, it's a connection through the children. I love my Mechutanim. I just want to go on record as saying that. But it's not the same. It's not the same. It's the lid. It's not this. It's the lid. It doesn't fit. <laughs> the lid. The lid that doesn't fit exactly. And then it also goes on the to your best friend and stuff we talked about yesterday. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Stuff somewhere. Right. Right. It's different. It's right, just, yeah. just different degrees. I give you a bracha. You should discover it very soon. Amen. Okay. Amen. Okay. Chorgo. Okay. What's next? Uh, right. Chorgo levado. The Mishnah had said that even though by other relatives. We include not only them, but their son and their son-in-law. But if I have a stepson who's puzzled to testify for me, it doesn't go beyond my stepson. He's puzzled to me, but not his son nor his son-in-law. Okay, that's what the Mishnah had said. Tanu Rabbanan Chorgo Levado. So there's a brisa that says the same thing at the beginning, but then it continues, and it says, Rabiosi Omer Giso. Rabiosi then says, a gis as well. Now, what is a gis? It's important to know. It's a gis. It's what we call a brother-in-law, but it's not always a brother. No, there's two different kinds of brothers-in-law. When my sister, my sister's husband is my brother-in-law, but that's not called a gis. That's called baal achosa. That's a totally different animal. A gis is when my wife's sister's husband. My wife's sister's husband is my gis. And there's two guys who are married to two sisters, so the two guys are gisim to each other. So that, uh, th- that says Rabiosi is Giso. And we don't know what Rabiosi is saying about Giso, he's just saying Giso. Mm-hmm. Now, Vitanya Idach, we have another Brysa that says Giso Levado, <clears throat> that a brother in law, a Gis, only the Gis is possible, but not his son or his son in law, just like we said by a Choreg. And Rabbi Huda Omer Chorgo. And Rabbi Huda says, no, Chorgo, stepson. So, my Omar. So, what is going on? What are these Bryce is saying? It's very cryptic. So, Ile Mahachikar. Let's suggest the following. Chorgole Vadov Adin Ligiso. So, initially, the Bryce says that a stepson and a Gis are only puzzled, but not anyone, not their extended family. But also, Rabbiosi Lememar Giso Levadov Vuhu Adin Lechorgo. And comes along Rabbiosi to say that a Gis. Is uh, only a gis and not his extended family, v'hu hadin lechorgo, and and um, but th- there's a problem with that girsa. So they change the girsa and they say, but not but only a gis, but a stepson is puzzle plus his extended family. Elamasnisin. So that's problematic because our mission at the Ketani giso hu v'nova chasano money. Then you're going to have a problem because in our Mishnah which says that a gis, both he and his extended family are puzzle, turns out that it's going like nobody. It's not going like the Tanakama, and it's not going like Rabbi Yossi, and it's not going like Rabbi Yehuda. Because with these two brises seem all to indicate the way you're reading it, that a gis is only him and not his extended family. And our Mishnah says a gis and his extended family are puzzle. So lo Rabbi Yehuda v'lo Rabbi Yossi. Ve'ela So maybe I'll read it as follows. So the Tanakam of the Brysa says, stepson, only, only a stepson, but not his extended family. And a Gis, both he and his extended family, like our Mishnah says, And Rabbi Yossi says just the opposite, that a Gis, only he is puzzled, but not his extended family. And a Choreg, a stepson, um, uh, he and his extended family are puzzled. The Elahadatani Rebbe Chia Shmona Avos Shein Esrim Ba'arba Keman Loka Rebbe Yosi Veloka Rebbe Yehuda. But that's going to be a problem because if you go through the list of people who are puzzled in our Mishnah, there are really nine first generation people because we count Choreg. But Rebbe Chia's version is there's only eight. So Rebbe Chia's Brisa seems to be saying that both a Choreg and the geese. In other words, the, our Mishnah has eight people who not only are, are puzzled to the second generation, right? And if they're puzzled to the second generation, what that essentially implies that because he excludes Choreg, but he includes Gis. But if you're telling me 
that both Reb Yossi and Reb Yehuda uh, basically hold that there's nine on that list. Either you add Gis or you add Choreg, right? So then there's, a no, there's nine people on that list of people who are puzzled to their second generation. Um, so Rebbe Chia doesn't seem to be holding like either Rebbe Yossi or Rebbe Yehuda because he can't say eight, he should say nine. So Elahachi Ka'amar, Chorgo Levado. So therefore we have to reconcile Rebbe Chia, Rebbe Chia's number eight, with someone who holds that neither a Choreg or a Gis are their extended family is possible. So who's that person? So you have to read the Bryce as follows. Chorgo Levado, Aval Giso Hu Chasano. So we're going to say that Rebbe Chia goes like Rebbe Yossi. And it's, we're going to read the brisa like this. The Tanakam of that brisa says that a stepson, only he is puzzled, but not his extended family. <coughs> but a gis, both he has an extended family or puzzled, like our mission. And Rabbi Yossi comes along to say that both a gis and a choreg, only they are puzzled, but not their extended family. Umasnis and Rebbe Yehuda, Brisa Rebbe Yossi. And therefore, our Mishnah goes like Rebbe Yehuda, who says there's nine on that list of first generation people who are puzzle, including Gis, that are puzzled to their second generation. And Rebbe Yossi is like Rebbe Chia's Brisa, who says, no, there's only eight, because he excludes both Gis and Choreg. Amar Rebbe Yehuda, Amar Shmuel, Halacha ke Rebbe Yossi. Shmuel now says that we paskin like Rebbe Yossi. Now, it's important to note that Rabbi Yossi is also cited in our Mishnah. And in our Mishnah, Rabbi Yossi makes a statement that's different from what we've been learning from Rabbi Yossi up until now. Rabbi Yossi said, up until now, zu Mishnah's Rabbi Akiva. Aval Mishnah Rishona, dodo uven dodo v'chol haroi liyarsho. He says that in, only people who can inherit me are puzzled to Edus for me, but if this person cannot inherit me, he's not puzzled to Edus. So we're saying now that the halacha is like Rabbi Yossi, and a Gemara's Havamina is the halacha of Rabbi Yossi's statement in our Mishnah that anyone who cannot inherit me is kosher to be my witness. So if that's the case, so the Gemara now says, Hahi um, Matnas, let's look at the following story. Hahi Matnas, Adabi Chasim Gisi. There was once a star that was proof that Reuven had given Shimon a gift. Okay? And then Reuven contested the shtar. The shtar was signed by two gisi, and a gis cannot inherit. So the Gemara's Havamina is, is that if you paskin like Rav Yossi, then the shtar should be kosher. So Sova Rav Yosef la'achshura, do'amar Rav Yehud, do'amar Shmuel, halacha ka Rav Yossi. So Rav Yosef thought that the shtar is perfectly kosher because gisim do not inherit each other, and Rav Yossi says that any time people don't inherit each other, they're kosher for each other, and therefore they're kosher witnesses. And therefore the gift is a binding gift. One second. You're saying the halacha is like Rabbi Yossi of our Mishnah, but Rabbi Yossi was quoted in the Brisa saying that a gis is pasul le'edus, just not his extended family. So maybe that's, when, that's what we mean when we say the halacha is like Rabbi Yossi. The halacha is like Rabbi Yossi that a gis is pasul. Le'edus, and therefore the shtar should be possible. So uh, Rav Yosef responded to him and said, "Lo sal gadaitach, to Amr Shmuel, kagon ana upinchas da habin an achi begisi, avol gisa da alma shaper dame." So he says, "No, I'll prove it to you." Shmuel was once asked, "What's an example of a gis?" And he said, "Well, you know, my brother Pinchas, we're also gisim." Now, what was what was he, what did Shmuel mean? Shmuel had a brother; his name was Pinchas, and it just so happened that Shmuel and his brother Pinchas married two sisters. So they were both brothers, and they were Gisim. So what Shmuel was essentially implying was that the only time a Gis is puzzled to me is if he's my brother. That implies that if a Gis is not my brother, he's kosher to be, to be a witness for me. The Gemara Zobaya said to Rav Yosef, maybe that's not what Shmuel meant. V'dilna kagon ana u Pinchas mishum de Giso ka'amar. Maybe... Shmuel was just responding to the question, what's the definition of a gis? And he said, well, you know my brother Shmuel, he happens to be my gis, so if you want to know what a gis is, look at me and my brother Pinchas. He didn't mean to say that only if he's my brother he is he puzzled to me. No, any person who's a gis is puzzled to me. An example of that is my brother Pinchas. Not because he's my brother, but that just happens to be the situation. So Amr Zil Kine 
Kanya Be'ede Mesira Karabalazar. So Rav Yosef was getting confounded by his student Abaya. Basically, Abaya was saying, you know, we have a brisa that says that a gifts is puzzled, and so therefore the shtar should be no good. So Rav Yosef turns to the guy who's holding the shtar system, okay, listen, my student is hocking me at Shinek, I can't award you the, 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 pro- the property based on the shtar, but if you have witnesses who saw Ruven give you the shtar as a gift, so then that will be the basis of awarding you the property because we paskin like Rebel Lazar who says, Ede Messi Rikarti, that as long as there are witnesses who see the transfer of the shtar, that's sufficient even if the shtar is not signed by witnesses at all. It's still a valid, still a valid transaction. So can, if you can bring witnesses that saw Reuben give you the shtar, then I'll award you the property. But wait a minute, said Abaya. Ba'ama Rebbe Abba Moda Rebbe Lazar b'mezuyef mitocho shu puzzle. Bias is not so fast, Rebbe. He says, we know that Rebbe Lazar agreed that if there are no signatories on a shtar, it's okay. But if there are puzzle signatories on the shtar, then even if you have a de Mesira, that totally invalidates the transaction. So Rabbi Yosef relented. He said to the poor guy, he says, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go home. I can't give you the, the property. They're not letting me award it to you. Everything, every time I try to give you a, I give a valid argument to give it to you, they give me a <coughs> counter argument. So I can't help you. I got nothing. Next, Rabbi Yehuda Omer Vichula. Now, Rabbi Yehuda had said uh, that, um, that if there is a relationship between two people, they're related based on marriage. And that marital connection is severed. So Rabbi Yehuda had said that the uh, r- relation continues such that you're still puzzled. So, for example, if a person is related to a guy through his, because it's, uh, it's his sister's husband, Rabbi Yehuda was of the opinion, as long as my sister is still alive, that even after she dies, I'm still related to that guy, and I can't testify for him, he can't testify for me. In other words, the relationship continues even post-mortem, even if it was through marriage, and the person who died was the, was the marital connection. So, Amar Rabbi Tancham, Amar Rabbi Tavla, Amar Rabbi Brona, Amar Rav, Halacha Kareb Yehuda. So these rabbis say, we paskin that way. And Rav Amar Rav Nachman, ain't Halacha Kareb Yehuda. The Chen Amar Rav Bar Barchan, Rav Yochanan, ain't Halacha Kareb Yehuda. That the Halacha is not like Rabbi Yehuda. So therefore, if the marital connection is severed, because the, the, the relative dies, so then the relationship severs as well. Ika Damasin L'Allahad Rav Bar Barchan, aha. That some say that Rabbi Bar Bar Chana's halacha was being stead, stated on the following, which is connected to Rabbi Yehuda's statement. Ezu Dorish Rabbi Yossi Aglili, Uba Sayal Kohanim Halevim, the Ella Shofet Asher Yihyeh Bayomim The Torah says that when you have a conflict, you should come to the judges of those days, which sounds really superfluous. The Chital El Dachta Shadam Holech Etzel Shavit Shalohaya Biyomim? What, do you think you're going to go to a judge who's not alive in those days? In your days? Of course, it's the only judge you can go to. So, But what it is referring to is a relative who was originally a relative through marriage, and then that relationship was severed. So, And that's how we paskin, that you can go to a judge, even though he was previously your relative through marriage, but since now that relationship is severed, he's valid to be your judge. That's what the basically boils down to the same halach as Rabbi Yehuda, but here it's talking about judge, uh, being a judge versus being an aide. Now the Gemara tells us a story. B'nei chamua demar ukva krov kuhavu. So there's a story that the um, brothers-in-law of Mar Ukva, meaning it's, it calls them the sons of his shvigar. Basically his mother-in-law's sons, or his wife's brothers, right? Both, it's the same thing. And what happened was Mar Ukva was a widower. His wife had passed away. So these were his former brothers-in-law. So they came, and they came and they said, we have a din Torah, we'd like you to preside as the judge. Amar lehu lehu He says, I'm sorry, I'm puzzled to be a judge. So Amar lehi, my daitach kareb Yehuda, anan, my sinan igartami ma'araba, dein alacha kareb Yehuda. So they said to him, what, why? Because you think we paskin like Reb Yehuda, that even though the person died, the, the connection, the, the relationship is still there. He says, but we have a letter from Eretz Yisrael that says we don't paskin like Reb Yehuda. 
So Amr Lahu, Atu Bekaba de Kira Idbakna Bihu, the Loka Amina Pasuma Lahuladina, Elamishum de Lotsai Sisudina. So Marukva said to them, What, do you think we're stuck together with a wad of wax? In other words, we're not permanently stuck together. You're right. We're, uh, like he said, like a pound of wax. You think a pound of wax is keeping us uh, stuck together? Of course not. Once my wife died, you guys are not related to me anymore. He says, the reason why I'm recusing myself is not because I'm your relative, but the reason I'm recusing myself is because I know that if I judge against you, you're not going to listen to me. You're going to say, ah, he's a shlechta brother-in-law, right? And we're not, you're not going to listen to me. So that's why I'm recusing myself. That's why I'm puzzled, because I know that you're not going to accept my authority. Why? Because you saw me in my gatkas, you know, when, last Pesach, you know, when we were all together at the resort. And that's why you think I'm not, I'm not a judge, right? So, in other words, the familial relationship is not the basis for the psul, but he says, but you guys are not going to take me seriously, and that's why I can't judge you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.